Well, we are continuing our series called Always Growing, and every believer should always be growing. We never get to the place where we're enough like Him. We never get to the place where we can't be more fruitful. We never get to the place where we can't get closer to God and walk with Him in a closer way. So we should always be growing. This morning, I want you to understand very clearly that in order for us to grow, we have to have the Word of God. It is the key to our spiritual growth. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. That you may grow thereby. It takes the Word of God for us to grow. And when you just got born again and you're a newborn babe in Christ, you need the milk of the Word of God. But no matter where you are in your walk with God, it is the Word of God that continues to grow us. Without the Word of God, you just don't grow. At least you don't grow right. It's the Word of God that grows us up spiritually. It is an absolute necessity. You know, a baby without proper nourishment doesn't grow and develop properly. But you know, I figured out that even as an adult, our physical body, if you want to if you want to add some muscle, if you want to grow some muscle, well you got to have the right nutrients. You can't do that if you don't have the right nutrients. And so it is, no matter where we are in our walk with the Lord, we're not going to grow without the word of the Lord. Just can't do it. He says in this verse, he says to desire it. He tells you, he says, desire the pure milk of the Word of God. We need to stir up that desire. We need to decide, you know what, I'm going to be hungry for the Word every day of my life. I'm going to pursue after it and go after it. It shouldn't be something that we just kind of dabble in, but a passion in our life that we love the Word of God. I think a lot of people have dulled their hunger for the Word of God with the things of the world. And not necessarily evil things or bad things, but you know, they've always got time for the evening news, but they don't have time for the good news. They, they, they fill up their minds so much of the time with movies and TV and entertainment of all different kinds. Listen, there's nothing wrong with those things. Well, depending on what it is, right? I got to clarify that. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, watching a TV show and, you know, having some entertainment and a, a distraction, escape a little bit. You know, I get all that. But here's the problem is sometimes we so much saturate ourselves with those things that we dull our hunger for the Word of God. Right. I mean, when people, when people pick up the Bible and they say, well, it's just, you know, it's just boring. I'm telling you, they have dulled their hunger for the Word of God with the things of the world. Sometimes people get so focused on all kinds of information. They just have this information overload, and so they just don't have any more room for the Word of God. What I'm saying to you is, is this needs to be priority in our life, that we always hunger for it, we always have time for it, we always have room for it. If we're going to grow, that's what it takes. George Barna in 2002, he wrote a book called The State of the Church after he conducted some surveys of self-pronounced Christians. And this is what, or some of what he found about their knowledge of the Bible. Remember, this was from 2002, and things have just continued to get worse in this regard. And I want to say one more time, this was a survey of Christians, 48% could not name the four Gospels. In our nation, every other Christian, basically one out of two Christians, cannot name the four Gospels. I'm like, have you ever even picked up a Bible? I mean, it doesn't take very long to get to where you know what the four Gospels are. If you've ever read it at all, this is amazing to me that Basically, 50%, 48% don't even know what the four Gospels are. 52% can't identify more than two or three of Jesus' disciples. 60% of American Christians 
can't name five of the ten commandments. You reckon they keep them? I'm telling you, if they don't even know what they are, they sure aren't keeping them. It's amazing to me. How is it that preachers don't preach these things? The Ten Commandments? Wow. And it's not even half, it's 60%. They asked graduating high school seniors, born again high school seniors, over 50% of them thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. I mean, besides the biblical illiteracy, at some point I just want to go, how can you be that dumb? It gets worse. 61% of American Christians think the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. 71% of American Christians think that God helps those who can't help, or who help themselves, excuse me, that help themselves. They think that's a Bible verse. 71%, when they hear that, they think that's a verse of Scripture. George Barnes said, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't know what it says. And because they don't know it, they've become a nation of biblical illiterates. Well, here's a little bit of an update, just about a couple of things. In 2020, the Barna organization conducted some new surveys with some alarming trends. And here's one example. They ask this question. They say, do you agree with this statement? People are basically good. In spite of the fact that Jesus said, Jesus, our Savior, said, no one is good but God. That's what he said. See, without God... No one is good because no one is good but God. That's what Jesus said. Romans 3.12 says, There is none who does good, no, not one. In spite of the fact that Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In in spite of the fact that the Scripture says, Without Christ we are dead in trespasses and sins. And it makes it clear that people are evil. That inherently we are sinners. We're not inherently good. No, we are born into sin. That's what the Bible says. And yet in spite of all of that, 70% of evangelicals, 70% said that people are basically good. 72% of all Protestants, 75% of all Catholics said people are basically good. You can't be good without God. You can't be saved except by grace. How can these people even know for sure they're saved by grace, much less share their faith with others and bring them to Jesus when they think that people can be good without God? You got to know that you're a sinner, that you need Jesus to get saved. You got to know you need a Savior to get saved. Now, this next one is not just a survey of believers, but of all Americans. Of surveying all Americans in 2020, they found that 44% agreed that Jesus, when he lived here on earth, he was both God and man, but they say that he did sin some, just like the rest of us. Only 41% of Americans believe that he was both God and man and lived a sinless life. That tells me that there's no way that more than 41% of Americans are born again and saved because without a sinless, spotless lamb, we are left without a redemption It takes the spotless, sinless Lamb of God for us to be forgiven. He had to die in our place. And if if somebody doesn't believe that, they can't be saved. I'm just telling you, we need the Bible. We need to preach the Bible. And every Christian needs to know the Bible. We need to grow up and to do that. It takes the Word of God. It's so vital to our growth as a Christian. And yet, so many don't even have the simplest, basic knowledge of Scripture. We've got 
Bibles on top of Bibles on top of Bibles, and we've got it on our iPad and our computer and our phone and everything else, and yet people, by and large in America, are still biblical illiterates and don't know anything. 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Are you growing in Him? Are you growing in knowing Him? We need a deeper knowledge of Him. You can't really know the one true God apart from the Word of God because it is the, it is the Word of God who tells us who He is. You know, in our country today, religious culture of the day, people just kind of make up their own version of who God is. Even most Christians just kind of make up their own version of who God is. But if you're going to grow in your relationship with Him, with the one true God, you have to have the Word of God to know who He is. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or excuse me, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, it has been this way. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. You just can't belittle the Word of God. You're talking about the Son of God. John 1.14 tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You need to understand when we're talking about the Word, this is how that you can know the one true God. We, we can't just sideline this or think this is a small thing. If you want to know God, you want to have a relationship with God, you need to get to know the Word. And the deeper, the greater your understanding of the Word of God, the more that you're going to be able to know Him and understand Him. If we're shallow in our knowledge and understanding of the Scripture, I'm telling you, we're going to be shallow in our relationship and shallow in our Christ-likeness, shallow in our Christian character. So what if the Lord just, what if He would just give us a book that would tell us about Himself, who He is and what He's like? That would be awesome. Here it is. If you want to know Him, you want to know what He's like. Well, just tell me about him in a sentence or two. That's how shallow a lot of Christians are. If you want to know him, you dig deep. You dig into the Word of God. You search the Scriptures and you go over it and over and over. And I'm telling you, it'll take you a lifetime. But you dig into the Word of God to grow deeper in your relationship, in your faith, in Christ-like character, in maturity, it takes the Word of God. Jesus says in Matthew 4, 14, or 4, 4, it says, it is written, and Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus said this when Satan tempted him, and this was his response to that temptation. But realize this, that Jesus is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. And Jesus often did this, where he quoted the Old Testament. Listen, he was the Son of God, but he's quoting the Old Testament. He knew what the Scripture says, and we need to know what the Scripture says. But listen to what he said here. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I tell you, most of us like to eat, right? Most of us, we like to eat at least three times a day. Some of us, seven or eight. Some of us, just once, all day. <laughs> That's right. But when it comes to the Word of God, so many are starving their spirit and their soul. They get so little nourishment that spiritually... They never grow up. They never learn. They never become Christ-like. They just stay babies. It can't be just a little dab here and there. No, if we're going to mature and grow, it takes the Word of God. 
Jesus said to the religious people of his day, Matthew 22 and 29, in the NIV it says it this way, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. I can assure you, anytime we don't know the scriptures about a certain area of life, we're going to end up in error. But these religious people, they were in error. We need to understand, you can be real religious and not really know the scripture and be in error. And when you're in error, it brings all kinds of trouble, deception, all kinds of heartache. It opens you up. The the Lord says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You need to know what the Bible says. You need to know the Scripture. When we have a, a deeper understanding of the Scripture, then we can really know that one true God. Then we can know how to live to please God. Then we can know how to stand on the promise of God. Here's a little revelation for you this morning. You can't stand on a promise you don't know. You can't use a scripture that you don't know. You need to know what the Word of God says. It's the Word of God that strengthens and builds our faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want to have a growing faith? It takes the Word of God. In Ephesians 6, 17, it says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. We are in a spiritual battle. Every one of us. It will, if it hadn't already, it will become real to you someday. You may not realize it, But there are all kinds of spiritual battles. I mean, listen, when you're struggling with your marriage, it's not just a a thing with you two. It's a a spiritual thing too. When when your loved one is dealing with a life-threatening illness, I'm telling you, there's a spiritual battle. There's a warfare at, at work there. All kinds of things. When you've got strife in your workplace, there's a spiritual battle there. So many people get the tar whooped out of them because they don't know the Word of God. And you don't show up to a sword fight with a butter knife. A lot of Christians, they kind of halfway know two or three verses that they heard brother so-and-so quote, and so they think they're going to face off with the devil half-heartedly with a couple of verses. No! You show up loaded for bear, standing on the Word of God. And just like Jesus, you speak the Word of God. See, we need to grow up and we'll quit getting whooped all the time. He said, desire the pure milk of the Word. The pure Word of God. Too often, we get so much other stuff mixed in with the Word. If you're talking about the pure Word, that means nothing else is mixed in. We get way too much opinion of man. In fact, I caution you from using these new paraphrases all the time. You just need to realize, some of them, they even call them translations now. I can assure you they are not a translation of the Bible. They are a paraphrase. And they are not translating just the Word of God to you They are bringing in, it is not just telling you what the Word says, it's telling you what this person thinks that it means. They're telling you how this person has interpreted it. And I know that sometimes that those things can be helpful in learning and understanding the Scripture, but so often we bring in the opinions of man and we lose what is the pure Word of God. So important that we hold to the pure Word of God sound doctrine, that we're looking to God's Word for truth. We don't need teachers to just tell us what we want to hear. We need teachers who tell us what we need to hear. Speak the truth in love. There's too much feel-good gospel being preached today and not enough of the words of Jesus being preached today. 
too often people focus on what God can do for us. And oh, that's good. I love the promises of God. I love all the blessings and the wonderful. God is good, I'm telling you. I love all that He does for me. And, but we want to leave out the rest of it. And it doesn't work that way. It's Jesus, my Savior, He said things like, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Listen, I have preached that verse, and every time I've ever preached that verse, and I say, Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Did you know 100% of the time it's always been quiet? Nobody gets excited about denying yourself. Denying yourself. That means that you're going to tell yourself no. That means you're not going to do what you want to do, but you're going to take up his cross and then follow him. That's what Jesus preached Why isn't it being preached from every pulpit in America? Because they've watered it down and made it soft and easy. It's all about what God can do for you. And here's the sad truth. They miss out on what what abundant life is really all about. Instead of deny yourself... Some people have turned the gospel in just another way to indulge yourself. Just another way to get what you want. Oh, it's so much more than that. How we need to hold to the truth of God's Word. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Fables are stories. The Living Bible says misguided ideas. So you can twist the Scripture into saying just about anything you want it to say. People do it every day. It amazes me some of the goofy stuff that is being taught in our generation. Where someone will take just a little piece of a verse and they build a whole entire doctrine on it. And people eat it up. They think it's really deep. I want to tell you, you need need to dig deeper, but not dig deeper looking for some weird new thing. Instead, dig deeper into the Scriptures itself, into the Word of God. We need to hold to sound doctrine. You see that itching ears? It's always looking for something new, something strange, you know. Ooh, I never heard that before. In this book, if you look into this book with the help of the Holy Spirit, there will always be something new and fresh to you but it's not really new. It's always been here. And we need to hold to the truth of Scripture and not be taken in, not get to that place where we just want to hear some new weird thing. And we think that's deep. I want to tell you, if it didn't come from the Scripture, and I'm talking about the whole thing, if it doesn't come from the Scripture, it's not deep. It's a deception. The worst deceptions are the ones that are shrouded in just a little bit of Scripture. But if you're going to grow as a Christian, you've got to stick with the Word of God, with the truth of His Word. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. We looked at this one last week, but it's really important that we should no longer be children. No longer be children. We've got to grow up. He says, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. This is how we grow up. It is the truth of God's word that grows us up into Jesus. Deceptions bind us up. But when we stay in the word, we grow up into him. He said, desire that pure milk 
of the Word of God. And so I just want to say to you, when you're a baby, there's nothing wrong with that. You need the pure milk of the Word of God. You start with the milk. And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. If you haven't gotten the milk so you could grow thereby, then you still need the milk until you grow. But we should be growing. That we get to the place where we're ready for something besides milk. A big factor in all this immaturity, shallowness in the body of Christ, I'm telling you, is the lack of understanding of the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, listen to what Paul says. He says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. Well, this guy told it like it was, didn't he? I mean, he just straight up tells these people, I can't talk to y'all like spiritual people. Just carnal people, worldly people. He says, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able. For you are still carnal. Wow. He tells them, you're still not ready. You still need milk. And here's the evidence he gives of it. He says, for you're still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? And behaving like mere men? Just one example of how you can see where a Christian needs to grow up. They want to fight and argue, still carnal, always in strife, conflict, divisions. And we've seen a lot of that this year. Not just in the world, but in the body of Christ. Carnal. Grow up. Grow up. That is a sign that somebody still needs the milk of the Word so they'll begin to mature. But as we understand the truths, the basic truths of the Word of God, you see, then we grow and we're ready for more. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5 and begin with verse 12. And I'm giving you a lot of scripture this morning, but I'm just telling you we've got to tear down some old strongholds because a lot of people have this attitude today that a little dab will do you, and that's just not true when it comes to the Word of God. You need all of it you can get. You feed your physical body every day. How is it that we don't think it's necessary to feed our soul and our spirit every day? The Word of God. You can't live by bread alone, but it's by every Word of God. So here we are, Hebrews 5, 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. He's telling these people, you you ought to be leaders by now. You ought to be teaching other people, but you need somebody to teach you the first principles all over again. You've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, right and wrong. And you know what? In this context, I think he's also and especially talking about what's right and wrong doctrinally, what's right and wrong teaching-wise. You see, when you grow up, you get to a place where you know when something is really the Word and it's being abused. He goes on and he says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. I just want to work through this quickly. He says, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Too many. Still in elementary school, spiritually. It's elementary. We're going to talk about elementary principles, foundational principles. Just for a few minutes, I'm just going to skim over them. We just can't hardly scratch the surface of them. But I want you to realize that these are the elementary principles of Christ that babies need. And yet most Christians don't even have a grip on this simple milk from the Word of God. So let me just talk about them briefly. Oh, by the way, when he says, let us go on to perfection, that's not talking about being faultless and flawless. It's talking about maturity. Let us go ahead and grow up. We need to grow up. 
And here's what he says. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works. This needs to be preached. It's by grace we are saved through faith, and it's grace alone. But understand this, when you get saved, you're supposed to repent from dead works. This needs to be preached. You can't live the same old life. You have to turn from those things and give your life to God completely. Repent from dead works. This is a foundational teaching. And instead, we have so many that like those Corinthians, they're still babies. They are carnal. They are worldly. They still lie. They still don't treat people right. They still go to the bars. They still drink. They still cuss and use profanity and tell crude jokes. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm saying they need to grow up. This is a foundational teaching. Why isn't this being preached across America? It's repentance from dead works. Things in your life that aren't pleasing to God. Things in your life that are actually an open door for the enemy to bring trouble and heartache and destruction in your life. Repentance from dead works. You get that stuff out of your life. None of us is perfect. That's what people say. I agree. None of us is perfect. But we're supposed to grow up. Next he says, and of faith toward God. Faith is how we get saved. It's how we receive almost anything from God. But I actually think that to some degree this one is actually being taught. At least in many churches they do teach faith and talk about faith a lot. And that's a good thing. Next he talks about the doctrine of baptisms. Notice it's plural. Not the doctrine of baptism. It's not just water baptism. Yes, that needs to be taught. In fact, that's not even taught very much. We just say you ought to do it. But how about the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Do you realize that all of the gospels say that Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit, and fire? How do we just leave this out? There's so many people. We don't, we don't teach it. We don't talk about it. We need to understand that this is a foundational teaching for babies. Next, he talks about the laying on of hands. Such a powerful thing in the Scripture. You see people laying hands on, on people to be healed. Jesus said it in Mark chapter 16. He said, believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We see people, when, when they were going to send them out in ministry, they laid hands on them. There was times when they laid hands on people to impart a gift to them. And there was... in. Acts chapter 8, where Peter and John go down to Samaria, these people who had believed in Jesus and been baptized, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit, and they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And that's not talking about salvation. Nobody ever had to have hands laid on them to receive salvation. That's, That's just crazy. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit when hands were laid on them. How is this missed so much in the body of Christ? Why is it this being taught? And I'm telling you this morning, you see, I'm not just putting this on the body of Christ. I'm putting this on preachers. We need to be teaching the Word of God, preaching the Bible. Enough with the fables. It is God's Word that is life-changing. Next, he talks about the resurrection of the dead. Most people's understanding of the resurrection and of heaven are so shallow, they base all of their beliefs in that on things that are not even in the Bible. If you want to know about the resurrection, you want to know about heaven, search the Scripture. Quit going by what you've always believed. Quit going by what you've heard. And of eternal judgment, every unbeliever will one day go to the great white throne judgment and every believer will stand at the judgment seat of Christ don't even have time to get into that this morning but you see this is basic Christianity this is the elementary principles this is the milk of the word of God and yet most Christians don't even know the milk 
We need to leave these elementary things and get on to the deeper things. We need to grow up. I challenge you this morning. It is the Word of God that will grow you. Always learning. Always growing. Keep going on with God. In His Word. That's where you find real truth. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, notice it's the ones who believed Him, He said, if you abide in My Word... The King James says, continue in my word. Another translation says, stay in my word. You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. First of all, he said, if you stay in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. Then you really are my disciples. Listen, when you're a disciple indeed, when you really are a disciple, when you're a real disciple, you see, you're no longer a pretend disciple. If you don't stay in the word, If you don't abide in the Word, you're pretending to be a disciple. A real disciple stays in the Word. You keep growing. You keep learning. That's that's part of what being a disciple is, is you're a student, you're a learner. You're learning His way of life, and you do that through the Word of God. Then you're my disciples indeed. And something else happens. You know truth. Where do you get that? From staying in the Word. You stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. You keep growing in the Word of God, and you're going to know truth. And then something else happens. The truth makes you free. You get victory. You start overcoming in areas of your life where once you didn't think you'd ever have victory, and now you do because of the truth of God's Word has set you free. It'll set you free. You know, most of the time when people are struggling in an area of life or they're bound up or messed up in some area of life, it's because their thinking is wrong somewhere. But it's the Word of God. When you know that truth, it'll set you free. You know, when we get born again, we're born of the Spirit. And that is just the beginning of our spiritual growth. Last week, we talked about how that you have to choose to change because... There is no growth without change. Now, you can change things in your life and be going the wrong direction, but all growth requires change. And you see, after we're born again, we're born of the Spirit, but we're not done changing. No, it's just the beginning of God working in our life and changing us and making us who He wants us to be until ultimately Romans 8, 29 tells us that we are conformed into the image of His Son. But Romans 12, 2 tells us part of the equation here. He says, don't be conformed to this world. See, how are we going to stop being worldly? How are we going to be different from the world around us and truly be spiritual people? He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is the Word of God that will renew your mind, that will get you thinking the way that He thinks. And the end result of that is you end up living the way He wants you to. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, it is. It's not FYI for your information. This is not a book like any other book. It is not FYI. It is FYT for your transformation. It is to transform your life. Now, some people, religious people always do this. They see the Bible as as something to argue over. That's not what it's for. It's to change your life. It is life-changing truth. And it is the Word of God that grows us up in Christian character and Christ-likeness. Jesus prayed this in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. It is truth that cleans us up through the work of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells us what that truth is in his prayer here. He says, your word is truth. It is the word of God that shows us what's right and what's wrong. It shows us how to live to please God. It shows us who and what we're supposed to be. James 1, 21, 
through 25, he says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. Now, let's get this first. He says, you need to lay aside all that garbage. You got to get that out of your life. Again, going back to that repentance of dead works. You need to put aside those things. Get it out of your life. You can't grow up in Jesus as long as you're still bound. As long as you're still allowing stuff in your life that shouldn't be there. All kinds of compromises. You got to get that out of your life if you're going to grow up and be who he wants you to be. You lay apart all that filthiness, the overflow of wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, some people get confused about this because so often when people talk about souls being saved, they're talking about people being born again. And that is not at all what this passage is talking about. Because, listen, when you get born again, your spirit is born. This is talking about your soul. Your soul is not your spirit. In fact, Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God divides between the soul and spirit. They're not the same at all. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And as we receive the Word of God humbly, see, with meekness, then it changes us because it, it changes our soul. It brings deliverance and freedom, healing to our mind, will, and emotions. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let me just read on through it and we'll come back. If, if there's anyone who is a hearer and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So the first thing is, is you got to receive the word with meekness, humbly. And you know, there's a lot of ways that we can receive the word. You can read it in your own devotional time, and I challenge you to do that. I encourage you to do that every day. You could certainly listen to it on audio, but one of the ways that we so often hear the word is when we hear the word preached. And I just want to encourage you that, listen, I'm not telling you to just swallow whatever anybody throws at you. In fact, I challenge you. I dare you. After every sermon I preach, you go search the Word of God. You go read your Bible and search the Scriptures. Don't just go to some pet verse that you were taught one time, but you search the Scriptures and read the Scriptures. I'm telling you, you need to have this attitude that you don't just swallow whatever comes along. But when it's the Word of God... We need to receive it, whether we like it or not. He says, with meekness, humbly. And I'm not talking about any of you right now that have your arms folded. That's okay. I know you're just trying to stay warm. But it's something else when you're preaching to people and they're looking at you like this. I'm just telling you, the word don't get into a hard heart. You look at the parable of the sower where Jesus talked about the seed being sown. There were some that word did never penetrate. You know, we got to have that humbleness so that we'll accept and receive the word. Sometimes it's not what we like, it's what we need. And then he says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And I just want to point out to you, you know, we can all be fooled maybe by some other people some of the time, but when we think that we're an exception, when we have our justification, our rationalization, while we think that the Word of God doesn't really apply to us, we have deceived ourselves. That's not a good place to be. Verse 23 says, For if any is a hearer, not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and he goes away and immediately forgets what manner of man he was. It's not that we have no recollection of the Word of God. It's that we lay it aside. We walk away from it. But verse 25 gives us a real key here. He says, He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Remember what Jesus said in John 8, 31? You stay in the Word. You, he who abides in my Word, if you abide in my Word, then you're my disciples indeed. See, King James says, the one who continues in my word. And here he says that. He says, 
If you look into the perfect law, law of liberty and you continue in it, him not, uh, he, and it's not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one is blessed in what he does. So he doesn't forget because he stays in the word. He continues in it. And I want to tell you that if you'll keep this mirror of the word of God before your eyes, it will transform you. You know, nowadays we all use mirrors, some more than others. I mean, the pretty ones, they spend a whole lot of time in the mirror, I'm just saying. Primping until every last detail is perfect. And the Bible tells us itself here that it is like a mirror. It will show you who you are supposed to be in Christ. It will show you what it looks like to really live for God. It will show you what it means to grow up. It will show you what Christian character is. And in the process, it will show you things in your life that need to go. It will show you attitudes that need to change. But you've got to stay in it until you get it just right. You keep growing, you keep learning, and it just keeps changing you. It keeps showing you as you apply it and live it out in your life. It's so powerful. So, one of the ways that you can tell when somebody is really starting to grow up is it's not about them anymore. You know, if you have a baby in your home, when they want a bottle, they don't care if your show is on. They don't care if you're on the phone. They don't care if you're tired and you're trying to sleep. They're going to let you know because that's all they care about is getting what they want. And spiritual babies are a little bit like that. They just want what they want. They want their needs to be met. But one of the first things that happens when you start to grow up spiritually is it's no longer about you. It's no longer about, you know, I'm going to church, I will get something, I hope it's good today. It becomes, I'm going to church, I'm praying for this person or that person. I want to, I want to be used of God in some way. I mean, we go out in our community, we want to be used of, see, when you, when you care about other people and you're trying to minister to other people, help other people, and no matter how that is or how God uses whatever way, and He uses us all in different ways, but here's the point is that when you start to grow up, it's not any longer just about what you want. It's about what other people need. See, that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. It's no longer about myself and what I want. It's about fulfilling God's purpose in my life. Now, you see, we call our leadership teaching growing leaders because leaders are always supposed to be growing. If you stop growing, you stop leading. We should always be growing. Amen. 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 16. Remind them of these things. Charge them before the Lord. Not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of their hearers. The last thing that the body of Christ needs is more people who want to argue over the Scripture and things that don't matter. People that want to fight and argue all the time, they're the very ones the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Still carnal, still worldly. But what we do need is mature believers who have studied so that they're prepared to minister to others. Now, if you just got saved and you don't know a single verse of Scripture, and all you have is a testimony. You've got a testimony to witness to other people about the Lord. You need to know that. And if you only know a handful of verses, listen, God can still use you. Absolutely. I mean, you could pull out from your big arsenal of four verses and help somebody. I mean, I'm being a little sarcastic here, but I'm just saying, you can still help people. You can use the Word. You can talk to people about your testimony and help people. 
But don't you think we ought to be growing and learning more so we can do more and be more effective? There's somebody ask you about how, how they can get their marriage turned around and you, you've got some, some word to lay on them? Not just some ideas, but a scripture? Y'all quiet. So here's what he says in verse 15. Be diligent. The NIV says, do your best. This isn't something that we just give a half-hearted effort to. We dabble in. It's something that we do our very best to present yourself approved to God, a a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Wow. We're not ashamed because we've been digging into the word. We've been digging deeper. Still learning. Still growing. Listen, I don't want anybody to get under condemnation about this. I want you to understand, this is a challenge to get growing, to go deeper, no matter where you are, to make up your mind. You know what? I'm going to stay here. I'm going to grow in the Lord. I'm going to dig into the Word of God. And then he says, all Scripture. Well, let me finish this one. He says, to present yourself... A proof to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And there it is again. You don't need to be, get caught up in silly arguments with people. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to close with this passage, verses 16 and 17, he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. That's mature. Grew up. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'm telling you, it works for the man of God. It works for the woman of God too. That when you stay in the Word, it will correct you. It will instruct you in righteousness It'll reproof you. It'll show you what needs to change. But it, you see, through it all, it's preparing you. It's equipping you. Amen. I think I read that. That you'll be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, when you got saved, Ephesians 2, 8. By grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then in verse 10 it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared for us beforehand. There are things God has set in motion, opportunities for you to minister and help people. You need to be prepared for those things. And it is the Word of God that prepares you, that equips you to minister to others. See, when you grow up, this is what it's about, is ministering to others. And so, church, I just challenge you today, no matter where you are, if you're a a baby Christian, maybe you're one of those that you know in your heart you hadn't really been growing, or maybe you're, you're somebody that's been serving God and going after it. I just challenge you this morning to stay in the Word and keep growing. Keep digging in deeper in the Word of God. It will so change you, but it will also bring you into a closer relationship with the Lord. Stand with me. We're going to pray. And I'd like for our prayer partners to come this morning as we do.